freedom-loving people of France presented this imposing monument to the United States as a symbol of liberty. And for about 65 years, it has been standing here at the main entrance to a country in which liberty has been the beacon light of progress in 1776. The awe-inspiring towers of industry which rise behind this world-famous statue are convincing evidence of what follows in the wake of liberty and individual enterprise as practiced in the United States of America. Greater New York City is comprised of five flourishing boroughs, but time limits our visit to Manhattan, mother of them all. Being an island, Manhattan depends chiefly on its ferries, tunnels, and bridges for transporting millions of commuters daily. And foremost among its great bridges are the Brooklyn, Williamsburg, and Manhattan Triumvirate, gracefully spanning the East River, and the George Washington Bridge, crossing the Hudson River, the second longest suspension bridge in the world. Riverside Drive parallels the Valley of the Hudson and provides Manhattan with one of its main arteries of vehicular transportation. Continuing down the Hudson, we pass the Chelsea Piers, harboring great ships that bridge New York with the world at large. The island of Manhattan is founded on solid rock, providing a firm foundation for the colossal skyscrapers that dominate the skyline. And this is Wall Street, the great financial center of America. It received its name back in 1653, when Peter Stuyvesant, governor of New Amsterdam, ordered a protective wall built across what was then Manhattan's northernmost limit. After the American War of Independence, the capital of the new nation was established in Wall Street, and this statue of George Washington marks the spot where he stood and took his oath of office as the first president of the United States. Although the spire of Old Trinity Church is now dwarfed by surrounding skyscrapers, it was once the most conspicuous landmark in this district. Regarded as the parent Episcopal Church in America, this historic shrine was established in 1705 when Queen Anne gave the young parish a large grant of land. From the beginning, Old Trinity numbered Manhattan's most distinguished personages among its parishioners, and even today, some of their descendants still worship here. This unique graveyard, situated in the heart of one of the world's most active centers, provides a retreat for the living as well as the dead. Among the most famous names on its tombstones are those of Alexander Hamilton, Robert Fulton, and Captain James Lawrence. Not far from here can be heard the familiar rumble of the Third Avenue L, built over 70 years ago. The last survivor of a noisy network of elevated railways that were formerly considered to be the final solution to the traffic problems of New York City. We are now in that section of Manhattan known as the Bowery, so named because it was once the chief farm or Bowery of the Dutch West Indies Company. Today, however, it is a sad reflection on the best laid plans of the city founders, for in this fantastic maze of light and shadow, weary men are passing, unfortunate outcasts of society spending their final days in the dreary habitats of the old bar, which has degenerated into one of Manhattan's poorest districts. And this is Chinatown, a popular tourist attraction and a favorite meeting place for the Chinese who live in greater New York. There are about 30,000 of them, and Chinatown serves as a mecca for their reunions and assemblies. In the Stuyvesant Square District stands a most humanitarian institution known as the New York Infirmary for Women and Children, where the first cancer prevention clinic in the United States was established. During the years of the hospital's service, over 750 women doctors have been trained here, some of whom have gone out to devote their lives to missionary medicine in the farthest corners of the world. This institution was founded almost a century ago by the Blackwell Sisters, pioneer women physicians, and to this day it has been staffed and operated entirely by women. Here we meet two of the many volunteer workers, Mrs. Frank A. Vanderlip, president of the Board of Trustees, and Mrs. Nicholas M. Skink, vice president. They speak enthusiastically of plans for building a newer and greater infirmary. We salute the praiseworthy efforts of these women in the cause of humanity, 
where they and their associates disprove the general impression that New York is a city without a heart. Here in downtown Manhattan, Broadway begins its long and circuitous route, following the old trail that was staked out originally by the native Indians. Foremost among the architectural oddities of Broadway is the so-called Flatiron Building in Madison Square, once considered to be the world's tallest skyscraper. With the passing of time, other giants towered above it until finally it was completely dwarfed by the Empire State Building, the tallest man-made structure in the world. Almost a quarter of a mile in height, this gigantic edifice covers two acres of ground and supports 102 stories. Square at 34th and Broadway was formerly the Rialto of Manhattan, but it was eventually obliged to give way to the uptown movement of trade and traffic, which now maintains its peak in what is known as the Times Square District. Here's the great theatrical center of North America and the heart of Broadway, where the peoples of all nations eventually rub shoulders and marvel at the spectacular advertising displays. Crossing 42nd Street, we pause to admire the New York Public Library, a free American institution patronized by over 12,000 people daily. Continuing our journey along the East River Drive, we pass through delightful little parks and finally come to what may be considered the greatest and most important building project now underway in Manhattan. Here on a plot of land magnanimously donated by John D. Rockefeller, Jr., will rise the future headquarters of the United Nations, a compact group of buildings centered on the 40-story skyscraper that is to provide offices for the Secretariat. Uncle Sam has appropriated $65 million for this great project, which is destined to bring the nations of the world closer together in bonds of friendship and peace. When completed, the United Nations buildings will face the East River, where the Queensboro Bridge, connecting Long Island City with Manhattan, forms a picturesque setting, along with Sutton Place and the very commodious East River Drive. Commanding a dominant position on this thoroughfare is the New York Hospital and Cornell University Medical College, serving the public without discrimination as to race, color, creed, or financial means. A panoramic view of the Central Park area illustrates a little of the magnitude of mighty Manhattan. On a clear day, the vista extends itself by many miles in all directions, and at night, when the lights are all aglow, the view becomes a thrilling spectacle. On Central Park South in Plaza Square, there may still be seen a few of the horse-drawn vehicles that once added color and romance to the streets of old New York and now provide a unique experience for romantic couples and tourists who engage them for sightseeing trips through Central Park. Although the sight of a horse on the busy streets of Manhattan becomes rare from year to year, there are still about 20,000 of them serving mankind in New York City. A drive through Central Park in a horse-drawn carriage is a unique experience in which the past literally rubs shoulders with the present, for it's a case of automobiles to the right of us, automobiles to the left of us, automobiles behind us, and automobiles in front of us. No wonder the old gray mare ain't what she used to be. Nevertheless, she still cuts a fancy caper when she trots her way through Central Park. Probably the oldest monument in North America is this Egyptian obelisk in Central Park, a gift from the Khedive of Egypt. It weighs 200 tons and is said to be about 3,500 years old. The Metropolitan Museum of Art on the Fifth Avenue side of Central Park houses one of the world's greatest collections of art, designed for the cultural education of the public, free of charge. 
Yes, museums, libraries, churches, schools, and countless other educational and cultural institutions are still free to the public in this great land of liberty. At the Central Park Zoo, another free institution, we arrive in time to witness the feeding of the animals, the most entertaining of which appear to be the sea lions. White polar bears are carnivorous and quite dangerous during the mating season. In fact, before these more formidable cages were built, the keepers were obliged to carry guns for self-protection. And here is the laziest animal in the zoo, old Hippo, who stands up just long enough to be hand-fed. In reality, the hippopotamus is a member of the swine family, a tremendous aquatic pig whose native home is equatorial Africa. Central Park remains today as a great tribute to the foresight of such civic-minded men as William Cullen Bryant and Washington Irving, who fought untiringly to preserve its original boundaries from the inevitable encroachments of commercial and residential construction. Among the architecturally renowned edifices bordering on the Fifth Avenue side of Central Park is the Temple Emmanuel, the oldest reformed Jewish synagogue in New York City. It was originally founded by German Jews in 1845, but the present temple was completed in 1929, and its style of architecture follows a modern adaptation of the early Romanesque. Continuing down Fifth Avenue, we enter the shopping district where famous retail stores have supplanted the stately residential mansions that flourished here exclusively only a generation or two ago. And now we are passing St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is directly opposite the world-renowned Rockefeller Center, where in about 12 acres of priceless land were cleared of all former construction to make way for one of the world's most gigantic commercial developments, consisting of 14 towering edifices topped by the RCA building, housing one of the world's largest broadcasting companies, along with thousands of private offices, a shopping center, and in fact, all that goes with an ultra-modern city. Being international in scope, the flags of all nations are appropriately represented here in the plaza, where open-air dining and public ice skating are seasonal attractions. According to Greek mythology, the founder of civilization was the god Prometheus, and his statue stands here representing a great benefactor of mankind, as does this giant statue of Atlas, appropriately placed in front of the International Building. On the roofs of some of the buildings of Rockefeller Center, colorful gardens provide restful retreats for the employees, as well as attractions for sightseers on especially conducted tours. There are about 20,000 permanent tenants in Rockefeller Center, and it is estimated that an average of 80,000 visitors pass through the buildings daily. St. Patrick's Cathedral engages our attention again as we view it from the roof of Radio City. Its design is based on that of the Cathedral of Cologne, and it has been standing here for about 75 years, one of Manhattan's major landmarks and a praiseworthy monument to the faith that inspired its construction. The City Hall is another famous landmark, around which the administrative affairs of New York City have functioned for almost a century and a half. And towering over it is the gigantic Woolworth Building, one of the world's tallest skyscrapers and a fitting symbol of mighty Manhattan's spectacular growth. Nevertheless, the old City Hall still holds first place among the important landmarks of New York and many of the city's most prominent leaders have been associated with its history, not the least of whom is the Honorable William O'Dwyer, the present mayor of America's largest metropolis, competently holding a position which is considered to be second in magnitude and complexity only to that of the President of the United States. 
Manhattan is particularly noted for its world-famous department stores, where the styles of a nation are inaugurated, and shopping itself becomes a thrilling experience. We are now on Park Avenue, where the Grand Central Terminal has lodged itself in the very center of the highway, at a point where thousands of unseen trains arrive and depart daily through a network of phenomenal underground construction. After circling around and through the station, Park Avenue moves into a busy lane of swank apartment houses, private residences, exclusive clubs, and elaborate hotels, the largest and best known of which is the Waldorf Astoria one of the world's outstanding hostelries, which has contributed generously to the social and commercial development of Manhattan since 1893, when the original Waldorf Astoria was erected on the site now occupied by the Empire State Building. This new and gigantic successor of the Mother Hotel, representing an investment of over $40 million, was opened in 1931. It contains 47 stories with 2,200 rooms and a permanent staff of over 2,000 employees. Among the many restaurants in the hotel, our choice is the Starlight Roof, where pale celestial stars hang in clusters from the ceiling, twinkling down upon a colorful assembly of patrons, including members of royalty, diplomats, socialites, industrial leaders, and artists of stage, radio, and screen. On this occasion, it is our pleasure to meet Miss Ann Miller of movie fame, escorted by C.R. Smith, President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of American Airlines, Frank A. Reddy, President of the Waldorf Astoria, and Henry B. Williams, Resident Manager. During the quarter of a century of its glamorous existence, the Starlight Roof has been host to many world-famous bands. This one in particular has won international acclaim under the leadership of Xavier Kuga. The orchestra now renders a popular samba composed by the conductor and known as Kugats Nougats. And here we meet Mrs. Ted Saussier, prominent New Yorker, and Lanny Ross, one of America's favorite vocalists. Xavier Cougat, a popular exponent of South American rhythm, has probably contributed more than any other band leader toward popularizing this particular style of music. Nougats and dance form is a delightful morsel, and we would like to remain here for an encore. But the Starlight Roof is only one of Manhattan's centers of gaiety, where the thrills of nightlife are traditional, and where the heights of nocturnal dazzle are reached in the glittering lights of Times Square and Broadway. And so life goes in the mother borough of New York City where the pulse of a nation is centered and all the world is represented through its conglomeration of race, color, and creed. And it is here on the gay white way that we most reluctantly say farewell to mighty Manhattan.